This time on Colores. Painter Eli Levin keeps the tradition of social realism alive. I want to set up a problem. It's not just yes and no, how we can solve that. It's a mess that I'm trying to expose. Farms feed our bodies, and some say art feeds the soul. And in Nebraska, an artist residency program called Art Farm is taking care of both. It's the experience that you can try something, you can experiment, not worry about failing. Tony and Emmy-winning playwright Terrence McNally uses his art to affect change. We knew it touched on social issues, but we just tried to make it a good show that would keep an audience entertained and moved and thoughtful for three, close to three hours. Considered a child prodigy and currently touring worldwide, Rachel Barton is following her dreams. Playing the violin is what I was meant to do with my life. It's my calling. It's who I am as a person. It's all ahead on Colores. Eli Levin wrestles with societal problems through his paintings. I never doubted that art should be what we kind of loosely call humanism, about people and ideals and a better life. Realism is a very vague term. At one point I was going to have a show called Social Realism with some other artists and they didn't like the term and they said we have to call it critical realism, which is used in Europe. So I fought like tooth and nail. I said, come on, I want to be a social realist. That's the communist type of realism, you know, but they wouldn't go for it. The socialist realists were more like in the cities showing the problems of city life, poor people, tenements. That's more my type of thing. Like these bar paintings, they may not seem obviously social realist because they're not workers and they're not uh, about society in an active sense, like demonstrations or all those things which I also paint. But the bar is sort of a contemporary version of what happened to social realism, and it's the tragic side of our society. There's sort of a, a substrata that was left behind that can't keep up with all the uh, competition. and. I always identified with that because I, my kind of art was also left behind. So I would say, well, this is, you know, we're in the bar, at least they're not bothering us. We're having a good time getting drunk. And uh, we're avoiding all the great American society and all the pressures. Well, of course, that's kind of a terrible way to live and I stopped drinking 40 years ago, but I still feel sorry for these people in bars who lead this uh, luminal life, this dark life without realizing it. It's also a great theater because people in bars will do crazy things and they're in a, they're in a stage. He's part of a series I did in the last five years of old New Mexico. I was trying to uh, show the village life, the, the old Santa Fe life. When, when I came here, it was like that right here in Santa Fe uh, when I moved in in the 60s. And I have to say, I don't really have a right to paint Spanish Americans because they have to paint themselves. You know, there is a whole movement and it's not a great thing to paint other groups than your own group, but I, it interests me. I'm a lucky artist, I have to say, because I've had a long career and I've survived. The problem for the artist is a social economic problem. Social realism is 
dead in the water, in a sense. And there are no longer a movement of social realism that I know of. I don't think there is. But so I'm really kind of a neo-social realist trying to keep up the tradition of these guys from the Depression. I overcame it in myself to the point where I could keep doing the social realism and enjoying it. I didn't, most of my teachers and everyone changed their styles. Half of them became abstract. Some of them gave up. Even when I run a drawing group or uh, an etching group, I am more old fashioned than anybody that comes. If I really tell them the limits of my thought, they can't relate to it. They're, they're too modern already. I mean, I'm old fashioned. I think I just, by now, it's, it keeps me alive just selfishly. I hate to say I'm one of those self-perpetuating egocentric artist who only paints for himself, but there's a lot of truth in it. I came up with a brilliant idea for a painting in my sleep the last year. I got the phrase in my head, praise God, eat and die. So it's a pretty, it's a powerful painting. And everybody just goes, oh my God. But uh, who's going to hang that painting, you know? That was one of a series where I had uh, the rich guys at the top, uh, the 1% with prisons behind them and jet planes dropping bombs. And then the middle, I had the middle class all trying to maintain some kind of dignity and climbing all over each other, trying to get a little higher. And then poor people on the bottom. Uh, I had all kinds of variations of the three tiers, some of them very funny, others not so funny. Ironically, a social realist is trying to communicate with people. And I spent half my time repainting my paintings. I, I've repainted at least half of my paintings in the last few years. It's very hard to do a political painting or a social realist painting. Problems are much more complicated now. I can't figure out any clear answers to anything. What's real? In my feeling, unphilosophically speaking, just the simple, what they used to call humanism, Feelings, dignity, nature, nothing too complicated and, and pressured. I, I like the simple pleasures, healthy things. Given the atmosphere of art in America, I've made a tremendous stand. Like Ibsen writing plays, I want to set up a problem. It's not just yes and no, how we can solve that. It's, a mess that I'm trying to expose. I've thought of every subject I could think of that, that's not a complicated political thing that I, that I would have to be an expert and read the newspaper every day, but if there's any social problem that I can spot, I'll try to paint something about it. An art farm in Nebraska provides a sustainable way for artists to explore their work. There are images and sounds we usually associate with life in the heartland. But there are also images and sounds that make some places unique. Here's space, do what you want and you don't have to worry about someone looking over your shoulder that you are doing this. You can experiment and I encourage experimentation. Welcome to the Art Farm. Created in 1993, this artistic enclave sits on half of Ed Dady's farm a couple hours west of Omaha. Ed's nephew works the production side of this land growing corn and soybeans. And while that farm work goes on, Visiting artists spend their time appreciating the rhythms of rural life. 
that's sort of typical of the way artists work around here. It's like long periods of thought, you know, trying to go through the process. So it's, it's, it's a reason why I sort of like recommend they come for two months, because it takes one month to get through all the other stuff, then they work. On this late spring morning, a poet and two painters have immersed themselves in the farm's creative atmosphere. On the website, Art Farm seemed like kind of strange and adventurous, like not like your average residency. 29-year-old Rebecca Johnson is an impressionist artist from Asheville, North Carolina. The Art Farm gives her a window on a world that's different from her usual environment. There's something just strange and amazing about walking down a dirt road and just being able to see for miles and knowing that like you can walk and walk all day and you'll be on that same dirt road and it'll still pretty much look the same. 24-year-old Amy DePlacido traveled 1,600 miles from Middleton, Massachusetts. She found the pace of the farm fueled her passion for linear art. I think it really slows you down here. I think that's, um, I think that's really important to learn too, especially coming from the city and just knowing like, you know, that hustle and bustle, like it doesn't really matter. The geography also inspired her artwork of straight lines. And seeing those lines of cornfields and soybean, and you can see right down and everything's placed in a grid. So I'm very inspired by these man-made, like, geographical lines on the landscape. Sycamore. Lone mare under the arced limb. Here, a list of yellow things. For poet Meredith Clark of Seattle, the art farm offered a new look at her view of writing. I think it's been actually a real life-changing experience in a lot of ways. Um, learning an awful lot about the way that I work. You know, I think a lot of people make the mistake sometimes of, of coming to a residency and assuming that they're going to turn something out. She also had to learn the process of printing her poetry, the old-fashioned way. This has probably taken me um, about an hour and a half or two hours, and it's just uh, six lines of type. The art farm has welcomed artists from 10 different countries. Space is limited to fewer than two dozen residencies a year, and in exchange for room and board, the artisans help work the farm. A current project, is restoring old barns, which see duty as studios and living quarters. On this day, an old bathtub became a spa of sorts. It gets hot here during the day, so we're going to fill it up when we need to cool off. Jump in the tub, go back to our studio and work. We're already doing that with the hose occasionally, but this will be better. <laughs> The landscape has become a repository of artwork completed by previous residents. Carol and Bernard Smith say they make the pilgrimage from Indiana on a regular basis to see what's new. I remember when Ed first started this, it was like, how is he going to get people to come here? But it just never stops. I mean, it just seems like every year he's got more and more and more, and it's wonderful. Perhaps it's the liberation of open space. Perhaps it's the serenity to be found here. Ed and the artist will tell you, it's inspiration without encumbrance. It's the experience that you can try something, you can experiment, not worry about failing. About very serious social themes, Playwright Terence McNally talks about his prolific career and the social boundaries he pushes through his work. 
Terrence McNally is a name synonymous with theater. He's the writer of Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune and Masterclass, the book writer of Kiss of the Spider Woman and The Full Monty, just to name a very select few, and his show Ragtime, for which he won one of his four Tonys, and Terrence McNally is here. Welcome. Hi. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. You're also in town receiving the ACLU's uh, Beacon of Liberty Award, and so I'm wondering, with shows like Ragtime, which they're singling out, uh, which deals with race issues and class issues at the turn of the century, you've written a lot of plays about gay men. When you're working on these pieces, are you cognizant of what social change they might provoke? No. <laughs> I'd be too self-conscious. <laughs> uh, I just try to stay in the moment with the characters and think, what are they going through? And Ragtime, being a musical, had two brilliant collaborators, Lynn Ahrens, the lyricist, and Stephen Flaherty, uh, my favorite Amer living American composer. So we were together work, working on the show, loving the book. Doctorow is the great hero, Edgar Doctorow, who wrote the original novel. Such a profoundly inspiring work. But we um, had a great time writing it. Uh, we knew it touched on social issues, but we just tried to make it a good show that would keep an audience entertained and moved and thoughtful for three, close to three hours. It's a big one. It's an epic. Do you look, do you take the moment then to look back now and, oh, and see what, what Yes, it, yes. And when you see how the show reaches people and touches them, and I think it's changed some people's hearts. It's such a deeply felt show and the music adds a dimension to it that is, is something very, very special. I love music theater when it's done well. And I wouldn't call this show operatic. It's in the best tradition of musical theater. Rodgers and Hammerstein, uh, Back to Showboat, about very serious social themes, entertaining but with great heart. And uh, I, we've stood in the back of many theaters around America and seen audiences deeply moved by this story. And it's timeless, I think. It's as relevant today as it was when he wrote it. Even though the show is set at the turn of the, shortly after the turn of the last century, uh, it's always seemed a very contemporary book to me. So you're never, I, I was, in, and some artists admit this, that, that when they have constant exposure like you've had or, or more intimate exposure again, that they're tempted to go back and make some changes. Are, are you ever tempted to do that with your work? I am, but not with Ragtime. We worked long and hard and I think well on it. Uh, theater is collaboration and when you have the ideal partners, and I couldn't have asked for better collaborators on this. And then we were working from a book that inspired us every day. There's not a sentence in that book that doesn't sing. And uh, we just had so much fun working on it. And we had a wonderful supportive producer because it was a big show. And we spent almost a year in Toronto working on it and getting it ready. And, get, and that's where it premiered was in Toronto, not New York. Audrey McDonald, who was here last year. In Porgy and Bess, sensation. Yep. She was a sensation in this, too. Um, in terms of, uh, of looking at the plays about gay men, as I mentioned before, where do you, we're in a season now, fall season, where a sitcom is coming out, and uh, sort of this conversation is happening mm -hmm. yet again mm -hmm. about sort of the evolution and, and how acceptable it is. Do you, have you noticed a shift? Is there a sizable shift? Because we, we, well, we also talk about how we talk about these on both sides of the coast mm -hmm. and not necessarily in other pockets. Absolutely. I, I, the show, I, I think it's called The New Normal. I saw the first episode, and the, the villain in the piece was the homophobe. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it was so matter of fact that these two men are in a committed relationship, they're going to adopt a child, and I thought, we've come a long way since Will and Grace, and that just went off the air. So it, it's very exciting, the social change just in that area alone that I've experienced in my lifetime, and uh, I hope my work has somewhat been a part of it, and I do think the theater entertainment is a wonderful way to reach people's uh, hearts. And on a subject when people says, I'm anti-gay, that's usually an emotional reaction to something they don't, they don't understand why intellectually they might have that knee-jerk reaction, but when they're touched by characters and meet gay men and women in a play, a movie, or a TV show, and they start to like them, that's, that's civil rights moving it forward, the only direction it should be going in. Yeah. 
I want to ask you too about we, we've just seen these unfortunate incidents, terrible incidents um, across in the, all over the Middle East with the embassies, yeah. and and this is coming out of a, a piece of art, which you know I, I can't say that this film that has outraged a lot of the Middle East is necessarily art because it seems to be mm -hmm. cobbled together and we don't know the interest behind it, but to some degree, and this might be apples and oranges, you experience this outrage over your play Corpus Christi when it first opened because it depicted Jesus Christ as gay and his disciples as gay, and, and you had this uh, just terror rain down on you, you had yep. death threats. I mean, what do you do in a situation like that? How much responsibility do you feel when you know that something like that might happen, that this that will trigger this sort of effect? Well, I, I think you try to stay the course because I, I think um, if there is a message in Christianity, it's that we're all divine and any one of us have the same divinity within us as Jesus Christ did. And gay men and gay women have that same divinity. And that's all the play is saying. Uh, I did not feel I was writing a blasphemous uh, indictment of Christianity at all, which, of course, the play was accused of being by people who hadn't seen it. And it sounds to me like what's going on now with this bit of film, it seems there's 70 minutes long, it sounds like a troublemaker got it onto Arab networks, translated just to inflame people. And uh, I think that's what was happening with Corpus Christi was uh, troublemakers, frankly. And anyone who experiences the play, it's a message of profound love and uh, humility and deepest respect for Jesus Christ. Uh, I think it reveals also the, the amount of homophobia that exists in the established religion, the hierarchy of the churches. And uh, I think they have a lot to answer for frankly. And, and as I said, I was definitely comparing apples and oranges. Yours yeah. is definitely a piece of art, not <laughs> not necessarily this film. But I want to ask you, finally, um, what is left in terms of what, what you want to explore? I know you started your career as a journalist. Mm -hmm. So are ideas constantly germinating? Because I wonder if, if you were sort of intimidated by your own success in a way, because you have a lot of expectations. No, I, I, uh, I, I surround myself with people who keep me Pretty rude. <laughs> uh, I'm married to a wonderful man who keeps my feet on the ground. Uh, I never worry about the a well running dry of things to write about. I think now that I'm getting older, I think about mortality more than I used to. Uh, I think maybe my work is a little more serious. I always thought it was serious, but I, I'm a little more thoughtful perhaps. But I think that's part of. Today I was, was taking a shower and decided I like being older. <laughs> Yesterday I didn't like it, but today I liked it because I felt there's some really nice things about being 74. Uh, so, Especially when you don't one, look it. Yeah. One day at a time and uh, this country is, gives the writers so much to think about. Uh, you know, I can't imagine ever saying, gee, I've written everything I want to write. I'll be babbling to the last minute, I think. Well, Terrence McNally, I've waited a long time to interview you, quite frankly, and it's, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Renowned violinist Rachel Barden Pine has a passion for what she calls life-changing classical music. We all know how inspiring music can be, and very few people know that more than world-renowned violinist Rachel Barton Pine. Rachel, good to see you. Good to be here. It's nice to be with you outside of the Sacramento Community Center Theater. You have a very moving message behind your music. Tell me about that. Well, um, I really believe that classical music is, of all the kinds of wonderful music that exists, classical is the kind that most brings people together. It's really a universal language, a music that's not of a particular time and place, but music that moves all of us in the deepest way possible and really uplifts our spirit. And it's my mission to share classical music with as many people as I possibly can. Now, you fell in love with the violin at a very early age, and boy, did you skyrocket to the top quickly. Ever since I started violin lessons at the age of three, um, I really felt that playing the violin is what I was meant to do with my life. It's my calling. It's who I am as a person. And all of the challenges I've had all the way through the years um, have never deterred me from that path. Because during my childhood and teenage years, my father was unemployed um, most of the time. And we never knew where the next scholarship was going to come from, whether I would be able to get a borrowed instrument and continue being able to pursue my dream. And holding on to my faith that music is the best way that I can um, share my gifts with the world. You inspire so many people through classical music. I'm curious, Rachel, how classical music inspires you. Oh, man. <laughs> That's a great question. Well, I mean, 
being a classical musician is fulfilling on so many different levels. Of course, um, there's all of the historic interest in learning about the composer's life and analyzing the score, and it's just very intellectually stimulating. And then, of course, it's fun, kind of like a sport, to get to play all those fast licks and all those challenging notes and, you know, make yourself you know, better and better as you practice and practice, kind of like, you know, doing Olympic figure skating or something. But all of that is just background to what it means to be on stage, which is really to fully experience the emotions of the music. And even more importantly, to reach out to those listening and share those feelings with them so that everybody gets caught up in the music together. And classical music goes farther than any other kind of music in terms of expressing absolutely every possible shade of emotion of the human experience. I want to just share music with absolutely everybody. And that's what you're doing here today with the Sacramento Philharmonic. Rachel, such a nice time speaking with you. Thank you. My pleasure. Next time on Colores. Pioneers of video art, Santa Fe's Steina and Woody Vasulka take us into their world. You know, it's no fun to go and say, today I'm going to make a masterpiece. That is of no interest to me. In his own time, artist Andy Warhol pushed the boundaries of what defined art, challenging expectations with his portrayals of popular culture. He was constantly looking at the current news to the newspaper, to magazines. And Show Decay is a beatboxer turning the tables on traditional art forms. Because there were some people who didn't like that I was beatboxing for ballet. Islamic artist Uza Mirza paints Arabic words as musical notes, combining music and faith. Every piece of art I do, I can't explain how I did it. It was meant to be. Photographer A.D. Wheeler has found art in the decay of urban landscapes. I guess I got bored of shooting the normal everyday stuff. Until next time, thank you for watching.